my dear Wormwood, even under Slubgob, you must have learned at college the routine technique of sexual temptation, and since for us spirits, this whole subject is one of considerable tedium, though necessary as a part of our training, I will pass it over. But on the larger issues involved, I think you have a good deal to learn. The enemy's demand on humans takes the form of a dilemma, either complete abstinence or unmitigated monogamy. Ever since our father's first great victory, we have rendered the former very difficult to them. The latter, for the last few centuries, we have been closing up as a way of escape. We have done this through the poets and novelists by persuading the humans that a curious and usually short-lived experience which they call being in love is the only respectable ground for marriage, that marriage can and ought to render this excitement permanent, and that a marriage which does not do so is no longer binding. This idea is our parody of an idea that came from the enemy. The whole philosophy of hell rests on the recognition of the axiom that one thing is not another thing, and that specially that one self is not another self. My good is my good, and your good is yours. What one gains, another loses. Even an inanimate object is what it is by excluding all other objects from the space it occupies. If it expands, it does so by thrusting other objects aside or by absorbing them. A self does the same. With beasts, the absorption takes the form of eating. For us, it means the sucking of will and freedom out of a weaker self into a stronger. To be means to be in competition. Now the enemy's philosophy is nothing more nor less than one continued attempt to evade this very obvious truth. He aims at a contradiction. Things are to be many, yet somehow also one. The good of oneself is to be the good of another. This impossibility he calls love, and this same monotonous panacea can be detected under all he does, and even all he is, or claims to be. Thus he is not content, even himself, to be a sheer arithmetical unity. He claims to be the three as well as one, in order that this nonsense about love may find a foothold in his own nature. At the other end of the scale, he introduces into matter that obscene invention the organism in which the parts are perverted from their natural destiny of competition and made to cooperate. His real motive for fixing on sex as the method of reproduction among humans is only too apparent from the use he has made of it. Sex might have been, from our point of view, quite innocent. It might have been merely one mode in which a stronger self preyed upon a weaker, as it is, Indeed, among the spiders where the bride concludes her nuptials by eating the groom. But in the humans, the enemy has gratuitously associated affection between the parties with sexual desire. He has also made the offspring dependent on the parents and given the parents an impulse to support it, thus producing the family, which is like the organism, only worse, for the members are more distinct, yet also united in a more conscious and responsible way. The whole thing, in fact, turns out to be simply one more device for dragging in love. Now comes the joke. The enemy described a married couple as one flesh. He did not say a happily married couple or a couple who married because they were in love. But you can make the humans ignore that. You can also make them forget that the man they call Paul did not confine it to a married couple's. Mere copulation for him makes one flesh. You can thus get the humans to accept as rhetorical eulogies of being in love what were in fact plain descriptions of the real significance of sexual intercourse. The truth is that whenever a man lies with a woman there, whether they like it or not, a transcendental relation is set up between them which must be eternally enjoyed or eternally endured. From the true statement that this transcendental relation was intended to produce, and if obediently entered into, too often will produce affection and the family. Humans can be made to infer the false belief that the blend of affection, fear, and desire, which they call being in love, is the only thing that makes marriage either happy or holy. 
The air is easy to produce because being in love does very often, in Western Europe, precede marriages which are made in obedience to the enemy's designs, that is, with the intention of fidelity, fertility, and goodwill, just as religious emotion very often, but not always, attends conversion. In other words, the humans are to be encouraged to regard as the basis for marriage a highly colored and distorted version of something the enemy really promises as its result. Two advantages follow. In the first place, humans who have not the gift of continence can be deterred from seeking marriage as a solution because they do not find themselves in love. And thanks to us, the idea of marrying with any other motive seems to them low and cynical. Yes, they think that. They regard the intention of loyalty to a partnership for mutual help, for the preservation of chastity, and for the transmission of life as something lower than a storm of emotion. Don't neglect to make your man think the marriage service is very offensive. In the second place, any sexual infatuation, whatever, so long as it intends marriage, will be regarded as love. And love will be held to excuse a man from all the guilt and to protect him from all the consequences of marrying a heathen, a fool, or a wanton. But more of this in my next. Your affectionate uncle, Screwtape. At the back of my copy of the Screwtape Letters, there's a description of Screwtape that goes like this. Screwtape's whites are our blacks, and whatever he welcomes, we should dread. Nowhere is this concept more prevalent than in chapter 21. Now, this chapter is about human sexuality, but that's not the best insight that this chapter has. In the third paragraph, Screwtape describes the philosophy of hell. That is, that one thing is not another. Now, this might seem like an obvious statement. Uh, rock is not a tree, a frog is not a dog, and a man isn't a woman. The things that define each of these things make it impossible for them to be the other thing. If you take away what makes them that thing, they are no longer that thing. And really, God made things this way. He didn't make a rock a tree, he didn't make a frog a dog, he didn't make a man a woman. He made them completely separate and different. So it would almost seem as if screw tape is agreeing with God. But remember, we should always fear what Screwtape says. We should reject what he likes. So what does he mean? Well, it actually comes in his application of this idea. Here's what he says. My good is my good, and your good is yours. What one gains, another loses. To be means to be in competition. What Screwtape is saying here is that the purpose of existence is for one being, a stronger being, to absorb as much as he can before another being can do so. All of life is competition. For human beings and animals, as Screwtape views them, it's eating and consuming and growing. For demons, it's to absorb the spirit or soul of other people, weaker beings, as he considers us, into himself. So the idea is all about a stronger being absorbing another being. That's what he means by one thing is not another. Now, if you didn't catch it, this is actually C.S. Lewis poking a little bit of a not-so-subtle joke at the whole idea of survival of the fittest. But that's not really important today. So what does this have to do with human sexuality? Well, as far as the demons are concerned, sexuality should just be one creature consuming another for, to further its own existence. He uses the example of a spider that eats its mate after they've mated. On the other hand, God's plan for sexuality is to be used within the confines of the loving and committed relationship that we call marriage. Screwtape describes it this way. God's plan is to have things be many, yet somehow also one. The good of oneself is to be, to be the good of another. This impossibility he calls love. God intends marriage to be an example of his love for us on this earth. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, it says this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Marriage is supposed to be a man and a woman committing to love one another 
unconditionally because God loved us unconditionally. Notice I didn't say committing to be in love. I said they committed to love. Screwtape calls the idea of being in love a highly colored and distorted version of something the enemy promises as the result. In our world today, we think that that storm of emotion that we call being in love is the main basis by which we should have our relationships. You know, look at any movie or video, song, book. If they're called romantic, they're going to have this idea in them. But if you really look closely at what they're saying, what they're actually describing is just this emotional feeling of being in love and not actually describing anyone who is actually loving. Daddy, I love him! Sure you do, Ariel. Sure you do. What Ariel is describing in that scene is she is actually giving the idea of this being in love, this idea of infatuation. Real love actually takes time. It takes effort. It takes commitment. It takes two people actually saying, I want to love you regardless of what else happens, and I will always love you regardless of what else happens. So you might be asking yourself, what are you saying, Matt? Ariel was wrong and Elsa was right? Fine. You can't marry a man you just met. Actually, you'll be surprised to find out that Elsa is also wrong because there are legitimate Christian reasons for why you could marry somebody you just met. I am going to get so many angry emails from parents right now. And when did my lesson become a big hate fist on Disney movies? How did that happen? Yeah, I'm okay with that. What I mean is, there are actually valid reasons for being married outside of being in love. Screwtape actually gives several. They regard the intention of loyalty to a partnership for mutual help, for the preservation of chastity, and for the transmission of life as something lower than a storm of emotion. So technically, you could marry somebody you just met, provided that they have the same intention for marriage that you have, which would be to honor God, remain committed, and be pure with your lives and with each other. Now, for a lot of you, your gut level response will probably be some version of, well, that doesn't sound very romantic. And that's actually the point. God doesn't view romance as we view it, as something of a necessity for marriage. It's actually something that he sees as coming from marriage and not leading to marriage. The purpose of marriage as God sees it is one of mutual help, where you have two people who come together to not only create a family, but also to build each other up in the faith, to bring honor to God, to encourage each other to grow closer to God through their love for each other and their mutual love for God. Without those things, no marriage will work. Now, please hear me on this. I'm not saying it's wrong to have romantic feelings for somebody. That's fine, but that can't be the only thing that you have because those feelings will go away. Eventually, you will fall out of love with somebody, and it doesn't matter how strong you think your love is. And again, we're not talking about love as the Bible sees it. We're talking about infatuation. You have to have something else come along and replace that. And that will have to be some kind of commitment to each other. Because if all you have are those feelings of love and nothing else, those feelings will go away and they won't come back. On the other hand, if you have a committed relationship, not only will you have something much deeper and stronger than just feelings of romantic love, but the romantic love will come again and again as long as you remain committed to the person that you are married to. So, have I destroyed all your dreams about romance and marriage? Good. I'm kidding. In all seriousness, though, a lot of you guys are at that stage where if you're not already thinking about romantic relationships, you will be very soon. And what I want you to be able to do is actually look at those relationships with the end goal in mind. Not just of having that boyfriend or girlfriend that you can spend time with and hang out with the other couples at school, but actually look at your relationships as something that is leading to something, to something better. And if your desire for a relationship, when you look at it in the long term, doesn't actually lead you to a place that brings you closer to God, then maybe that's something that you shouldn't be doing. Maybe you should be looking for something else than just a storm of emotion. Guys, thank you so much for joining me for lesson six. Uh, we will be back next week with Lesson 7. 
Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to know more or get more content, you can also go to our church website in the description down below. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next week.